Well, currently I work for the Science and Knowledge Division of Conservation International, which is uh, essentially CI's research arm. And I look at climate change impacts on uh, species and ecosystems, especially terrestrial systems, but uh, with strong interest in what's going on around the world. Well, I think it's definitely integrated in a place like Madagascar. You can't really talk about conservation without talking about development and in two, and two different scales, really. And I think Claire Kremen wrote about this really insightfully a, a, a dozen or so years ago when she was pointing out that there are some very important benefits uh, that return to conservation to national governments. And there can be benefits um, returning to local communities, but you really have to think much harder about how to get benefits back to local communities because it's relatively easy for things to accrue at the regional or national level to tour operators and others, but local communities often don't have the kinds of skills that are needed. The trickiest part really is that is in talking with communities or policymakers who aren't used to thinking about climate change adaptation. When we talk among ourselves in the adaptation community, uh, we often hit uncertainty very hard and, and for all the right reasons. There's a lot of uncertainty when you go from GCMs down to trying to do regional or local impact assessments. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't use modeling, but we need to understand that you know it's not a prediction and, and that we're using it to get some ideas about how systems may perform rather than uh, creating exact scenarios of what's going to unfold and what sorts of actions need to respond to that. So conservationists can learn from financial theory because financial markets have dealt with uncertainty a lot. Amy Ando and I did a, a piece in conservation biology recently about this. But just using, conservationists often say we're using portfolio theory or we use the word portfolio without actually knowing a lot about how financial markets formalize those sorts of ideas. The, you know, the key thing is really to understand that there's so, sort of a triage or a, a series of possible responses to climate change that we need to go through. And rather than arguing too much about the most controversial ones, the more important thing is to recognize that there are less controversial things that can be done first and to take those easier steps. And then when you're down to, you know, you know your last options, you know, when the wild condors are down to 25 or 30, that's when you start to, to worry about whether to take those more invasive interventionist actions. Um, and it's well worth saying that, you know, the very first and most important thing for climate change adaptation in terms of actions is getting uh, international policy on mitigation, because if things continue unchecked, then it's very difficult to see how any sort of management strategy can, can succeed very well in the long term, other than crossing our fingers and closing our eyes. Second thing on my list would be protected areas that, you know, maybe different in freshwater or marine realms, but in terrestrial realms. Uh, getting our protected areas in places that make sense for climate change is the best thing we can do in managing our existing protected areas for climate change. Then connectivity, uh, very important, as I've mentioned. Uh, the type of connectivity you may need for plants and climate change may be a little different than you need for large mammal movements and connectivity but those things can be complementary. And then once you get through those sorts of actions, then you wind up talking about managed relocation or ex situ management, pulling things out of the wild. But our energy ought to be going into, you know, controlling climate change, doing what we can and expanding protected areas and connectivity. And then it's, it's last resorts for a few species, hopefully take some of these more interventionist actions. You know, some of our translation of experimental results into the, the field as we've moved from greenhouse experiments out to face rings or things, but, you know, there hasn't been a lot of fidelity of the experimental results moving out to the field, but that means that we're challenged to understand why. Certainly what's happening in the greenhouse is happening. It just doesn't necessarily get reflected when you're out working in a whole ecosystem. So yes. it's 
it's not that the greenhouse isn't important, but we got to think about both levels to understand, well, really, how's the system functioning? Why is what we see at the individual plant or leaf level not being reflected when, when we're out there in a whole ecosystem? And then you need to think broader again about how disturbance and other kinds of factors can, can play into the system. I think it'll be much more mainstream, but I think at the same time we'll have this set of tools that lets us focus very specifically on adaptation so that I think while it'll be less implemented by specialists, uh, because it will be more mainstream, I think the, the people who are implementing it will have specific tools and specific concepts very focused in on adaptation. It'll be very clear what parts of their management action plans are focused on adaptation. Thank you.